Welcome to Women of the World, a show which gives a voice to women from around the world who have chosen to make the United States their home. Here's today's moderator, Anne McKenna. Hello, viewers. My name is Anne McKenna, and welcome to today's episode of Women of the World show. I am the moderator, and I have the honor to introduce an amazing guest. She's going to be sharing a subject that is close to our hearts. But first, I have the honor to introduce amazing co-hosts that are joining me in the studio today, starting with Elda Strong. Welcome to the show, and it's so good to see you. Thank you, Anne. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Next to her is Nadia Giordana. Welcome. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And now, I have the honor to introduce to you our guest to the studio, and her name is Verily Four. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Yes, and you are a chef, which is a subject that everybody can identify with food, and it's just, it just seems to be part of our favorite thing to do together and family and all that. But first, would you please start sharing with us your immigration story? What made you choose United States and particularly Minnesota for your home? All right, so I came here about nine years ago following my husband. I came with my family and work actually brought us <coughs> here. And uh, that's how we, we um, arrived in Minnesota. His company was based in Bloomington here. Um, but this was not our first uh, time in the U.S. We actually met in the U.S. many years ago. In between, we moved back to Europe. We lived in several countries in Europe. Then we went back to the U.S., to New York City, where we lived, and our daughter was born. And again back to Europe and then to Asia for a few years right before coming to Minneapolis and uh, nine years ago we came back a third time to the US where we're now feeling home really in Minneapolis. Are all these moves prompted by your husband's work or? Yes, some, yeah, it was all due to, to work professionally uh, related, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was always following and two years ago I decided I wanted to do something on my own. Our children are now grow up and off to college and I've started um, this, um, this company. Cooking was always a passion of mine. Um, I love cooking and eating and I think in, in the act of cooking and eating brings so much um, people together. It really brings people and families together. You can spend a lot of beautiful moments around the table as well as preparing as well meals. How would you describe your cooking style? So my cooking style is mostly, I would say, family style. Um, obviously very much influenced by my French roots, so I do a lot of French cooking, but also influenced by my travels. So mm -hmm. I actually grew up uh, as a child in Ivory Coast in West Africa, and as I said, traveled in different countries in Europe and spent seven years in Asia. So my cooking is also influenced by the Middle East and Asia, Southeast Asia, so mostly Thai, Vietnamese, um, Malay, Indian as well. Mm -hmm. So describe to us, um, growing up, your mom was a cook. Absolutely. And well, grandparents. And so tell us a little bit about that and how that influenced you. Right. So they were not cook per se, like it was not their profession, but they loved to cook always. And my parents and my, my mom and my grandmothers, both my grandmothers were always cooking. And we always um, made dinners and meals scratch from home. Uh, really going out to a restaurant was very seldom. And when it was happening, it was really a treat. But we always cooked at home. Sunday meals were very special. My mom would come up with the, um, some special dinner, special uh, pieces of meat or special cakes and the Sunday lunch would be a celebration. So she would be in the kitchen and cook and always pairing a good uh, bottle of wine with it. And that's something she also got, I think, from her own parents and uh, which I got from as well from my mom and my grandparents as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I suppose it's a very French thing as well to cook as a family and, uh, and to cook also every day, I would say. Um, mostly from scratch, yes. Dans quelles circonstances est-ce que tu as vécu en, en, en Côte d'Ivoire? So oui. In what made it be that you were in Ivory Coast for 
Mm. And for how much of your childhood? So I, you, right, so I lived in Ivory Coast for 11 years and uh, I'm, I was from basically seven years old until 17 and um, or oh, 18 uh, until high school actually and it was actually uh, my parents who actually um, lived there for many years. They were working there so this is where we lived mm -hmm. during all my um, teenage childhood and teenage years, yes. And, and how was that? How does that, I mean, because seven is still young, but seven mm -hmm. through adolescence is, is kind of formative years. And it is. to be in a totally different country, climate, uh, racial questions, Absolutely. how was that? Um, that was actually that was um, wonderful. That was fantastic. We, we had uh, we there was a, a good harmony in the community. People from different races would mingle together. Um, it was great. We were exposed to many different cuisine and cultures and religions. And I think this is actually what kind of planted the little seed into me to keep on traveling and moving around and, and meet different people from different cultures, from different backgrounds and, and traveling. I think that's where my love from travels actually and traveling came from. Did you learn bits of language too from the different countries? Not in Africa because uh, I recall the, the main language is French there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, well, I spoke when I was in college. I learned um, I learned um, Spanish and then later on I took German as well. So I speak a bit of other languages as well, Spanish and German, and obviously French. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how how old were you when you left France? I was seven years old. Okay, so seven years old. So do you have memories of? actually living in France and growing there? I but do have, m I would say, mostly summer memories okay. because we were fortunate enough to be able to go back every summer to uh -huh. visit our family and to go back home for a month or two. So I do have those memories. The memories of living there, um, I don't have a lot because, yes, I was seven years old, and that's many, many years ago. <laughs> so I, I have very few memories um, of living in France. Uh, I have memories mostly of our time with the family when we would go and visit our grandparents on my mom's side, on my father's side, and playing with my cousins in the summertime time. Those are the kind of memories I have. More than everyday memories like going to school or mm -hmm. the daily life, those memories are more, I guess, when I used to live in Africa, in Ivory Coast. Wow. So how has that um, impacted you culturally? Because, you know, I mean, you are a little child and then moving to all these places. How do you identify yourself culturally? Oh, so that's the most question, uh, most difficult question I ever <laughs> always get. <laughs> People ask me, where are you from? <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess it's a tricky question because I think deep down, my heart still belongs to France. I'm French, but I spend actually most of my life outside France. And um, I love to go back to France every summer to visit my family, my friends. I enjoy the lifestyle in France. Yet, I, I don't think I completely belong to France. I'm not, uh, um, some of my friends who know me well always tell me, you're not a real French person <laughs> in between commas. So I get, I got influenced by those different, yes, cultures, countries. And I, I guess I would call myself more citizen of the world okay. because I got all those influences. I think that's uh, especially for people that uh, I mean I like the way you describe it citizen of the world because when you travel so much and you get so influenced you know I'm a foreigner and you know you feel like you don't fit anywhere quite completely. Do you experience that? I do, I do. Uh, even in France sometimes I feel I don't fit because I'm not I'm not a com completely French in the sense that I don't know exactly everything which is going on in France and maybe little um, silly things like you know um, a TV series of that my friends would talk about I'm like I don't know what you're talking about because I don't get to watch it here or little things like this but sometimes yeah, I think I may not belong completely anywhere on the other hand I think I can adjust adjust and adapt everywhere mm -hmm. and I love traveling That's and true. everywhere I, c I think I can fit somehow That's and as you said maybe not com right mm -hmm. maybe not completely but I guess it, is, it would be easier for me to move to another country if I would have again because I've moved around Perfect. already um, so much but yeah the upside is like you fit better um, in would other places. Would you say the cooking and the food and the dishes that you share and prepare uh, helps to breach, broach any gaps and it's a great way of communicating and sharing with the different places that you've lived and, and bringing that home to where you are now. I, I believe so. 
To me, I think cooking is also an act of love. Mm -hmm. And when you cook something and you bring it to a friend or to a neighbor or to someone, it's uh, right away you, you kind of break some ice. And you, there's, a, um, there's something around food, I think, that people can share and experience, which is different from other, other things. And yeah, I guess that's the beauty of it. And it's, um, it helps, yes, I, I guess cooking helps people get closer and get together. Mm -hmm. And so two years ago, you say, I want to do something that's really mine, uh, uh, and you start cooking. So tell, take us through that process. Mm -hmm. What did you think about? What did you, how did it conceptualize? So it was really, um, well, my life turned um, around that about two years ago. Unfortunately, I went through a difficult time in my life, and I decided I wanted to do something, work, go back to work again, because I had been expatriates for many years. and. I was actually, the story was, um, I was actually visiting a friend of mine in Mexico and we were in the market um, eating mangoes. And I told her, I told her, you can't imagine those mangoes bring me back to my childhood in, mm -hmm. in Ivory yeah. Coast. And I, apparently I got reanimated and I, used, I told her, you know, when I was a child, my mom would do this recipe, she would make ice cream, she would make some cakes, she would make some tarts with mango and that. I was really animated and my friend told me, you know, you should really look into doing some form of cooking, maybe giving classes or, you know, cook for people because that's something you seem to be so passionate about. And at the beginning I thought, mm, I'm not sure about that. But then the, the idea kept coming back and back and back and I thought, well, maybe actually she, that, that's a good idea and I should try to, to persevere and um, to look into it deeper, which I did. And then um, I started doing some research and that's how um, I created my, my small company. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. but Tell us a little bit ab about that company. So um, I've got three different, I would say, three different hats in this company. Uh, so one of them is actually giving cooking classes. So in, in small groups or individuals, so I go to people's houses and I would uh, mm. uh, teach them a, a dish or, or two, depending on the time they pick. They can pick two hours or three hours. Then the second hat is personal chef services. Okay. So I go, for example, I have some clients, I go to the house once or twice a week and I would cook, let's say it's a family of four, I would cook three meals of four portions each and then they for three days and they would store them in their, in their refrigerator or freezer and then every day when they come home after work, if when they don't have time to cook or they can cook or they don't like to cook, some people don't like to cook, <laughs> they would just take them and reheat them and they would have a healthy uh, homemade dinner ready for them. And then the third, uh, the third hat I, I have is um, event organization. So some people mm. who want to celebrate something or just have a dinner at home, a city dinner or a small cocktail party, we would um, have a consultation and decide on the menu what, what they'd like. And then I would, um, I would come to the house in the afternoon, prepare the dinner. And those tests would not have basically anything to do in terms of food. And then I would prepare the dinner for the evening. Wow. That's amazing. So thinking about, um, your career, your new birthed passion. I mean, it's old, but now in practice, mm -hmm. uh, practical, and you are doing it. Have you thought about it being a fortunate thing? Because I'm just sitting here thinking, with all the moving you've done, and if there's more moving in the future, this is something you can do no matter where you are in the world. I guess so, yes. I think that's something I could take with me, yes, if I, if I keep on traveling and, and moving around, yes, yes. Wow. Do you have uh, a specialty dish that you're especially fond of? I do. I have several, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, I do like to make uh, little cream puffs, um, and because they are so versatile, you can fill them with ice cream and cover them with chocolate sauce, and you would have some profiterole. Or you can have them with uh, with um, um, some kind of different custards, flavored with vanilla and uh, or chocolate or whatever really you like, and then build them up as a little tower and make like a little croquant bouche or mm. pièce monté. So that's for the I would say for the desserts and and the um, savory sides um, I'll, I like a lot um, dishes which are um, stew like and w which can get a family mm -hmm. on the table you know like a nice boeuf bourguignon or something like that or, or a nice chicken tagine or something like that yes. Mm -hmm. Valerie you mentioned that um, the idea came out of a hard time that you were going through in mm -hmm. your life uh, I kind of like that. Um, do you have um, uh, reflections about 
making good out of uh, a hard time and how that relates actually to creating recipes. Right, yes. Yeah. So, so the reason I created this, uh, this company is uh, unfortunately, like many people, I went through um, a divorce, a uh, sad separation and painful one. And I needed really to change my mind and also uh, to take care of myself. And I need also to, to have some income. But I think the silver lining in this situation was if I wouldn't have gone through that, maybe I would have never created that company. I wouldn't have the, the need. I still had that passion of cooking before that, but now I was really able to express myself and to express and, and have it come out of myself and really uh, um, do something with it. Yes, and, and use it to um, use it to a good, um, how should I put it, to, to, to a good extent. Yeah. Yes. That's great. It's amazing how difficult times really transform us. It does. It does. Yes. And I, I think in those moments when, uh, when you see what you can do, you, you realize you have, uh, you have resources which were hidden or you, which you didn't even suspect you had. Mm -hmm. And finally, mm -hmm. you were able, to, we were able to make them come out and, uh, and use them. Absolutely. All of those images bring me back to cooking. <laughs> you, know, you have materials, you know, ingredients, and yes, there are recipes, but every once in a while, everything goes awry, and then you have to make something new, mm -hmm. something different from mm -hmm. the original recipe, and, and it gets transformed, and uh, often it's delicious. Yes, yes, and actually, to tell you the truth, when I use some recipes, I often actually use the recipe as a guideline, as a baseline, and sometimes, if I see an ingredient I like a lot, especially, for example, in Asian cooking, I love ginger, so I, w I tend to add more ginger than the recipe calls, and then another ingredient maybe I, I won't like so much, I'm thinking, mm, maybe this one I'll just skip, or I won't put as much, and, uh, and I'll also love to work with seasonal vegetables and, mm. uh, and fruits, of course. Mm -hmm. so what's in season and I think I, I love to develop and create new recipes as well yes <laughs> do you uh, do you have any plans for creating a cookbook in your future not at the moment um, actually several people asked me if uh, I would f I was starting to think about uh, thinking about putting all my recipes in a book because I'm starting to have a small collection of or recipes do you have now. them on a, do you have a blog I, uh, I don't have a blog but I have um, I have them on, on my uh, on on my computer, obviously, stored, and uh, I'm thinking now of maybe starting putting them in my, on my website or on my uh, mm -hmm. social media, maybe mm -hmm. one, one recipe a month or a week. Um, so that's something I have in mind, which I haven't completely developed, but that's something which I could see doing in the future, yes. Social media is good that way. It is, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so when you are doing your cooking, um, do you put in consideration um, the nutrition, the health aspect, and what would you share with us and the viewers in, in that connection? I do, I do. So um, actually being from the south of France, I mostly cook, for example, with olive oil rather than, than butter. So I use very little butter, except when I do desserts and pastries, but in all savory things, I, I, w I use olive oil. And I try, yes, I do try to cut down the fat, to put not too many fat. Uh, I don't fry many things. I tend to stay, for example, to roast the vegetables more than, um, mm. than frying them. And Although I'm not a vegetarian, I tend to have more dishes which are plant-based as well, and, uh, and using yeah, so vegetables and grains and uh, different legumes as well, like lentils and do some Indian dals or different, yeah, different grains. Beautiful. Uh, would you like to tell us about some of these recipes that we have here? Right, yes. Yeah. So those are little energy ball, which, uh, balls which I actually developed for a client and they are, those are little balls packed with lots of energy. They're completely, um, actually vegan even. Okay. So they're made of oatmeal, um, maple syrup, uh, peanut butter or almond butter and then you can add li uh, little, um, some seeds like those have chia seeds and uh, flax seeds and then you can flavor them with uh, lemon zest or add some uh, dried, cranber dried cranberries or chocolate chips, different, um, different things. Can they be carried 
like portable, you know, throw in the purse or your bag yeah, and carry right. them along. Right. So those are those are great because actually they they're raw. You don't even need to bake them. So and there's no baking. No, that's no gorgeous. baking, oh. and they they hold in the fridge or outside during the day. That's no problem. So you can put them in a small Tupperware and have them uh, with you. And you have when you have a, if you're a little bit low on mm -hmm. energy, you can <laughs> grab one or two and. You'll start again <laughs> mm. and they're great for little snacks because yeah. of the oatmeal they don't have you know um, they will uh, sustain you for a while you won't just have a peak of sugar of energy which, uh, which will um, go down after half an hour or 40 minutes that will sustain you for a couple of hours yes and of course there's nuts wow. in there so that helps with as that well too. yes yeah. yes mm -hmm. And the, the second one here, yeah, the, the mango. So that's an Asian, that's actually a Laotian. And a uh, stir fry. A Laotian stir fry, yes, from Laos, which is very easy to make. That's probably 15, 20 minutes to, to make. That's basically some stir fried chicken, which before was marinated in um, lemon juice with a soy sauce. And um, and then you just saute it with a bit of uh, tomatoes, mangoes, um, snow peas and uh, a few roasted cashew, um, mm -hmm. cashew nuts. Now you mentioned that it was Laotian. Mm -hmm. What would set that apart? What one ingredient stands out to make it Laotian as opposed to Chinese or some, or some thai other? Or um, or thai. So in, in, was in this case, in, um, the ingredients used in, um, in Laos or Thailand or Vietnam are very similar or Cambodia. They always, mm -hmm. most of them use mangoes because that's in the region everywhere. Mango might Fish be one. sauce, um, uh, soy sauce, um, ginger, all those spices are used everywhere. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, all those ingredients could be found in all those Southeast Asian countries. Uh, but this is a specific um, Laotian recipe. I can't tell you what it is Laotian versus uh, Vietnamese, for example, or Thai, but the ingredients are very similar of what you would find in Thai cuisine, for example. Okay. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. I like that. And then what we have below are more uh, little things that you would have like um, for um, a little cocktail party. So this, this is like a small um, bit dip with goat cheese and um, it's uh, served in a little filo shell. So you just have a little bite and it's covered with um, a nut. So something as well, very healthy. It's basically bits with yogurt and goat cheese, a bit of seasoning like and salt and pepper. Pureed, I assume. Pureed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That sounds delicious. That's top That's on my list. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should send you the recipes, uh, ladies. <laughs> And the fourth one is, um, it's perfect, what would be perfect for, for now actually, those are little skewers, like Greek skewers, so they replicate uh, the ingredients you would find in a Greek salad. And so mm. they're made of tomatoes, cucumber, feta cheese, and black olives. And then they're drizzled with a bit of olive oil and uh, yeah. balsamic vinegar. Wow. Those do ma make a nice little hors d'oeuvre. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. I absolutely think you should put together a book <laughs> <laughs> with these recipes. So, thank you. Yes, yeah. I will. I will keep that uh, keep, keep in mind. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, mm -hmm. it would. Yeah, it would be nice to have a nice compilation. Actually, of uh, several recipes. So, Valerie, I'm going to ask you a different question, which is, what is your favorite um, story about something unexpected? that someone who's taking a cooking class for you, expecting to learn cooking, learned something unexpected. Do you have any stories like that where um, the act of cooking itself is transformative to the person? Well, um, one of my clients, I gave some cooking classes um, to, and she also helped her organize some dinners, was very, very insecure about cooking. And, and I think that by cooking together, I gave her confidence in her kitchen again, mm -hmm. to be able to, to make a dinner, to prepare a dinner, and to cook. Um, she's an executive in the company, and as she said herself, she does very well in the ballroom, but she's not as confident in her kitchen. And and, and little by little, by cooking several times together, she got really confident. And now she goes on and makes her own creme brulee and wow. different dishes. And yeah. uh, so to me, that was really rewarding to see I could help someone be more confident and be able to um, to, to enjoy cooking even yes. more. Yes. Yeah. So as a woman that has gone through tough times and, and gone through it to the other side and overcome, and now you're, you're doing these amazing things, what can you tell a woman that is going through tough time or women that are still struggling with going through difficulties, what can you say to women generally that are 
Uh, right, yeah. I would say, I guess, you know, something which is maybe a bit cliche or typical, but yet very true, is believe in yourself and give it a try. And you may fall, but you can get up again. You make mistakes. I mean, I made mistakes, and I'm sure I'm going to s make more, but you learn from every, you know, fall down, and, and you become stronger and better. And, uh, and I would say trust yourself. Trust you can do it, because I think all women here, we always have those resources, which sometimes we're not even aware we have <laughs> and someday they, they come out and uh, and they can help us it help us yeah, m make something great of our lives and um, our professions many times when we have we are faced with that task of believing ourselves and we know we want to do it but we can't seem to find uh, it's really because of the people around us so um, we do we are believing in ourselves but the support yes is really ex is really important can you tell us a little bit about what support you had in when you were at that transition of starting right your so I had the support of uh, several friends who helped me and really encouraged me and uh, a friend of mine helped me build my website it was uh, mm -hmm. the beginning another one actually the same friend when I told her about my project we spent one entire after afternoon and she asked me all kind of questions to make sure this is what I wanted to do what would be what were the challenges I could foresee why I would succeed or what could maybe not succeed so uh, at the end of the session I came out with a much clear mind of what I wanted to do where I wanted to go my children as well, I have, both children, I have two children, which are young adults now, but they, they were an incredible s um, support and they encouraged me. And my daughter still helps, helps me now, actually, cooking. Oh, and nice. uh, She works for me at, uh, during the summer sometimes. So, yeah, the support of friends uh, and having friends and relative belief in um, believing in what you do and what you want to do is, uh, is very um, important. And I've been really grateful to have that, yes. So what do you do? for fun for fun so what i love to do uh, is uh, um, yoga i love to do yoga mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. something um, i like to do i like to um, to read as well when i get the chance at the moment i don't have so much time to read but but something i love to do take walks with my dog you know like me, most of the things um, everyone does and spending time with my children and my friends of course around a good meal yeah <laughs> yes so I know you started out saying you love to cook and you love food. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at you and I'm saying, well, how does somebody who loves food <laughs> look like this? So what's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess maybe that's a French thing where we, we, we love to eat and we do eat a lot by certain standard, but I guess the French of your European your portion is smaller than the portions here. So we tend to eat everything, but maybe in smaller portion. And also, besides yoga, I also like to do some sports. So I exercise as well. So I guess it's a, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. And I try also to, to eat at um, regular time um, every day, or uh, only three times mm -hmm. or four times a day. And I, I was snacking, so for a little <laughs> tips. I do you <laughs> so before we run out of time, mm -hmm. um, where can we find more information about about you okay so you can go on my website which is um, www.valeriesfrenchkitchen.com and you can also check out my Facebook page and my Instagram page and they are both ah. under Valerie's French Kitchen well thank you very much um, for viewers we have we are running out of time and I just want to take this time to thank my co-hosts um, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. It's just been an amazing show and verily thank you for coming out and sharing that wisdom with us and to our viewers. Thank you for viewing and we'll see you next time at thank Women you. of the World show. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs>